Professor Wang Gangwu, Chairman of ICS Yusuf Wishak Institute, Mr. Choi Shing Kwong, Director of the Institute, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. I'm very happy to be here to celebrate ICS Yusuf Ishak Institute's 50th anniversary. As uh, Professor Wang just told you, I was privileged also to celebrate your silver anniversary in 1993, 25 years ago. And I'm glad to be back again a quarter century later to mark this further milestone. ICS was one of the first research institutes that the government set up after Singapore became independent. In fact, Dr. Goh King Sui proposed this idea to cabinet in 1966, just one year into our nationhood. And subsequently, ICS was established in 1968. Why did our founding fathers think of setting up ICS amidst all the pressing economic and social issues they faced? We had high unemployment, a stagnant economy, race relations were still tense after the two race riots when we were in Malaysia. We needed to build houses and schools to clear slums and create jobs and gradually foster a sense of nationhood. And yet, amidst all these priorities, the founders stepped back from their day-to-day -day concerns, reflected on Singapore's strategic situation and decided to invest resources and talent into building a research institution to study Southeast Asia. Why did they do this? Having lived through momentous upheavals, they understood instinctively how closely our fate was intertwined with the regions. The war was in not very ancient living memory. Southeast Asia was still a troubled and unstable region. Singapore had just separated from Malaysia. Confrontasi was barely over. President Suharto had only recently taken charge and restored order in Indonesia. The region was on the front lines of the Cold War. Communist forces had made advances in Indochina. The Vietnam War was hotting up. Thailand, Malaysia and Singapore all faced communist insurgencies. And the insurgencies were encouraged and supported by China, which was then in the throes of the Cultural Revolution. Our founding fathers were acutely conscious that to survive in such a difficult environment, a small and newly independent country needed to acquire a deep understanding of the region. Because small countries do not shape world events, events shape us. In Dr. Goh's words, Singapore had to acquire a delicacy of perception, a delicacy of perception of the affairs in the region. So that we could foresee difficulties and opportunities and prepare in advance to address them. But this delicacy of perception was then seriously lacking in Singapore. In the cabinet paper proposing the setting up of ICS, Dr. Goh pointed out that we know more about Melbourne than we know Medan, more about the English Channel than the Sunda Straits. Dr. Goh also believed this expertise had to be developed outside the government. The government's policy and intelligence officers would be too bogged down by immediate day-to-day -day concerns to look at regional issues from a long-term detached perspective. By creating an institute that operated separately from the government, we could house eminent academics and researchers to develop deep knowledge of the subject matter, and they could then provide the government with independent insights. Looking through alternative lenses on the same issues which government officials had been working on. ICS was thus created as an autonomous organization by an act of parliament in 1968. And over the last 50 years, 
ICS has established itself as a respected research institute on Southeast Asian affairs. And this achievement is the work of generations of chairman, directors, and distinguished fellows. They include Professor Wang Gang Wu, Professor Colonel Singh Sandu, Dr. Sharon Siddiqui, Professor Chan Heng Chi, Mr. Kesevapani, Mr. Tan Chin Tiong, and Mr. Choi Shing Kwok, several of whom are here today. I would like especially to mention Prof. Wang Gang Wu and Professor Colonel Singh Sandu. Professor Wang is ICS's longest serving chairman, having been chairman and served with distinction since 1992, more than a quarter century. <laughs> However, his association with ICS goes back even further. In fact, he was one of the candidates considered to be ICS's founding director in 1968, but at the time he had other commitments. Nevertheless, he served ICS in varied capacities over the decades before becoming chairman. He was a member of ICS's first regional advisory council, which has since become the International Advisory Council. And ICS has benefited from Prof Wang's advice, knowledge, dedication to academia, and guidance. Therefore, it's befitting that ICS has honored Prof Wang with a permanent gallery in the ICS library, displaying his books, his private papers, and his photos. Prof Kernel, the late Prof Kernel, was ICS's longest serving director. He served for 20 years, from 1972 to 1992. And Prof Kernel laid lasting foundations for ICS during his tenure. He established the annual ICS Roundtable, which attracted government officials, scholars, and businessmen from around the world to exchange views on Southeast Asia. He launched several publishing initiatives, notably the Southeast Asia Affairs Journal. And today, ICS is the region's leading research center. It's produced more than 2,000 books and journals, the largest scholarly producer, publisher of research on Southeast Asia and the Asia-Pacific. ICS marked another significant milestone three years ago when we renamed it the ICS Yusuf Ishak Institute. It was a tribute to Yusuf Ishak, Singapore's first president, who had dedicated his life to modernization and education and whose values were congruent with ICS's own. It was also a reminder of ICS's long history and strategic mission. Like ICS, Southeast Asia has come a long way in the last 50 years. In 1967, the year before ICS was formed, the leaders of Indonesia, Malaysia, the Philippines, Singapore, and Thailand took a leap of faith and formed ASEAN. The original five members were later joined by Brunei, and later still Vietnam, Laos, Myanmar, and Cambodia, bringing ASEAN to 10 member states. ASEAN's original objective was political. The five founding members wanted a regional platform for dialogue and cooperation. They wanted to put old suspicions and hostilities behind them, to work through new problems and conflicts peacefully and constructively, to foster a stable environment within which each country could concentrate on its own nation building. And this objective was achieved. One major test for ASEAN was dealing with the Vietnam-Cambodia conflict from the late 70s onwards. ASEAN then consisted of six members, the original five plus Brunei. The members had different perspectives on the matter. For example, Thailand was a frontline state with a border with Cambodia, while the Philippines and Indonesia were one step removed. It was a considerable diplomatic achievement that the ASEAN members came to a common understanding and adopted a unified ASEAN stand. ASEAN rejected a fait accompli achieved by force of arms. It insisted on the international rule of law, the inviolability of international borders, 
and the legitimacy of national governments. It advocated its position forcefully and effectively at many inter intellectual fora, international fora, including the UN and the non-aligned movement. It helped to bring about the eventual political settlement and security of Southeast Asia for all 10 of ASEAN's present member countries, who at the time were not on the same side. This experience strengthened ASEAN and provided members the basis to broaden their collaboration beyond security issues. The next focus was economic cooperation. Initially, this had not been a high priority. The focus had been politics. So, when ASEAN began exploring economic cooperation in the early 1980s, the members found ourselves in very different economic positions. Singapore had an open economy and was strongly pro-market and pro-trade, but other ASEAN economies were less outwardly oriented and varied in their readiness to liberalize their economies and to promote free trade. It therefore took several years for economic cooperation to build up momentum. And I remember participating in the discussions. I was then in the Ministry of Trade and Industry. And we, for the first time, were talking about a free trade area amongst the ASEAN countries. And I well remember at one of the early discussions, one of my counterparts saying, in all seriousness and sincerity to the group, we should not put up proposals to our leaders which our leaders will have to say no to. In other words, he did not feel that ASEAN was ready politically to embark on an initiative as bold as an FTA. But over time, as ASEAN economies developed, perspectives shifted. By 1992, we were able to launch the ASEAN Free Trade Area after a milestone in our economic cooperation. And we've come far since then. Today, the ASEAN economic community is a prime example of how ASEAN is larger than the sum of its parts. Together, the 10 diverse countries make up a dynamic and attractive economic group. It has a growing population of 630 million, which is more than 100 times Singapore's population, of which 60% are under 35 years old, and by 2030, we expect more than 60% of the population to join the middle class. And ASEAN will be the fourth largest single market in the world after US, China, and the EU. From the broader strategic perspective, ASEAN has also strengthened its member standing in the world. It has enhanced our collective voice on the international stage. It's put ASEAN at the center of the regional architecture. It's enabled us to engage major countries like the US, China, India, and Japan, and key organizations through ASEAN-centric platforms. A long list, I'll just uh, name you a few and spare you the alphabet soup. ASEAN Plus One meetings, ASEAN Plus Three, the East Asia Summit, the ASEAN Regional Forum, and the ASEAN Defence Ministers Meeting Plus. Today, the ASEAN community has three pillars, economic, political security, and socio-cultural. We will continue to pursue closer integration under this framework and progressively strengthen the ASEAN community. However, ASEAN will not become an ASEAN Union on the model of the EU the European Union. It's less ambitious than the EU in terms of scope, membership, and integration. ASEAN does not aim to have an ASEAN Parliament, an ASEAN Court of Justice, an ASEAN Currency, or an ASEAN Central Bank, not even in the very long term. ASEAN is too diverse to aim for a European-style union. Our countries have different histories and cultures, diverse political and economic systems, contrasting views of the world. When our interests align, we work together. Where we are not ready to cooperate, we put matters aside for the time being to take up, perhaps later, 
when conditions are riper. In recognition of this diversity, ASEAN works by consensus. If this decision-making process can be slow and unwieldy, we can only move when all the members agree. And sometimes if there's no agreement, we may not move at all. But this arrangement has on the whole served us well because it requires member states to recognize and consider one another's national interests, irrespective of the size of the member states. One area where ASEAN member countries do not have a unified stance and for fundamental reasons is our strategic outlooks. A clear instance of the impact of this and how ASEAN members can find common ground despite our differences is the South China Sea dispute or issue. Not all ASEAN members are claimant states, and even among the four claimant states, Vietnam, Malaysia, Brunei, and Philippines, there are different concerns and attitudes and nuances. ASEAN has to recognize this diversity, but we are still able to find common ground. Because all member states share certain common interests on this issue, ensuring ASEAN's relevance, upholding the international rule of law, securing regional peace and stability, and maintaining freedom of navigation and overflight in the South China Sea. Therefore, we are able to agree to take progressive and constructive steps to manage the disputes and the overlapping claims. For example, by concluding a, con concluding a code of conduct in the South China Sea on which ASEAN has commenced negotiations with China. Therefore, while this consensus building process is laborious, it has its uses and merits. Member states find it meaningful to work together to seek common ground. They don't think of opting out from or leaving the group because their sovereignty or national interest has been suppressed or undermined. And ASEAN, once it has arrived at a decision, does not change its position lightly. External partners therefore see value in deepening the engagement of the region and ASEAN. Looking ahead, ASEAN must continue working hard to remain an effective and central player in the region. The 21st century is a very different world from the 1960s, when ASEAN and ASEAN were formed. The Cold War is long over. Southeast Asia today is largely peaceful and stable. But there will always be hot spots and difficult issues to deal with from time to time. We also have to adjust to a strategic balance which is shifting both globally and in the region. New powers are growing in strength and influence, especially China and India. Individual ASEAN countries must adapt to the new and changing strategic landscape. Countries have to take into account the policies and interests of new powers while maintaining their traditional political and economic ties. There will be new opportunities. China has put forth concrete major initiatives such as the Belt and Road Initiative and the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank that will benefit the region. India too is cultivating its relations with ASEAN and pursuing a more activist foreign policy beyond the subcontinent. Individual countries stand to benefit and so potentially will ASEAN as a whole. At the same time, the ASEAN grouping has to get used to new internal dynamics as each member feels the influence of the different powers to different degrees. And we must accept the reality of these tidal pulls without allowing them to lead to fault lines forming within the ASEAN group. All ASEAN countries want to maintain and develop their ties with the U.S., even as the U.S. is intensely reviewing its trade and foreign policies. The U.S. is still the region's security anchor and the world's largest economy. We recognize that the political mood in the U.S. has changed. The Trump administration is rethinking America's international role and how the U.S. should advance its interests and influence in the world. And it's rethinking radically. 
However, the U.S. has clearly affirmed its determination to stay engaged in Asia, and countries hope that it will continue to play an active role, particularly in Southeast Asia. In this shifting environment, it's important that ASEAN works actively to maintain its centrality and relevance. ASEAN centrality is crucial, and yet ASEAN has no automatic right to be the center of the regional architecture. There is nothing to prevent other groupings or regional cooperation projects from being launched. Some will compete with ASEAN, others will contribute in complementary ways to regional cooperation and stability. The Belt and Road Initiative and the Free and Open Indo-Pacific are two examples. Amidst this Darwinian process, ASEAN members must come together to maintain ASEAN's relevance and cohesion. Only thus can ASEAN remain at the heart of the regional architecture and a valuable partner and interlocutor to the major powers. What should ASEAN members and ASEAN as a group do to keep ASEAN relevant and cohesive? First, it's important that each member state supports and promotes the ASEAN project. Each ASEAN member has its own domestic issues and politics to handle, and governing a country internally is already an all-consuming affair. But ASEAN governments need to look beyond their domestic concerns, put emphasis on ASEAN, invest political capital in the ASEAN project, and make a conscious effort to think regionally and not just nationally. Only with this commitment by member states can we deepen our partnership and make progress in ASEAN. And indeed, ASEAN countries have given their support to the grouping gradually but progressively over the years. We supported one another through difficult times, such as the Asian financial crisis, the SARS outbreak, and various national disaster, natural disasters. Now we are cooperating in new areas, including counterterrorism, climate change, and e-commerce, cybersecurity. We've also adopted the ASEAN Community Vision 2025 to develop new blueprints for the ASEAN political security community, the ASEAN economic community, and the ASEAN socio-cultural community. We've laid out progressive steps, such as deepening transport connectivity and cooperation against transnational crime to strengthen the ASEAN community. As the ASEAN Chair this year, Singapore will do its best to take the group forward through our chairmanship themes of resilience and innovation. We will initiate projects to strengthen our collective resilience against common threats such as terrorism, cybercrime and climate change. We will help ASEAN economies to innovate and to use technology to build a more dynamic and connected community. And one key project in this field is to establish an ASEAN Smart Cities Network to create attractive places in all our countries to live, work and play. Externally, ASEAN needs to deepen its web of cooperation with major partners. We are working on the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership which comprises ASEAN and our six FTA partners. When established, it will be the world's largest trading bloc, covering about a third of the world's GDP. We are also working with the EU on the ASEAN-EU Comprehensive Air Transport Agreement. This will be the first substantive aviation arrangement between two major trading blocs. And the RCEP and the ASEAN-EU Comprehensive Air Transport Agreement will bring tangible benefits to our people and our partners. But they involve significant trade-offs and compromises. The decisions will not be easy because so many parties are involved, and especially given the growing mood of nationalism and protectionism in many countries. But I hope the governments will take a long-term approach, assess their enlightened self-interests, and make bold decisions which will improve our people's lives. For half a century, ASEAN governments have taken such an approach and brought ASEAN to where it is today. This is a remarkable achievement, far exceeding what the founding leaders of ASEAN had imagined. 
The decades of intense interactions have helped to deepen mutual understanding amongst members and to socialize us to think regionally and not nationally. And this should equip ASEAN countries to cope with a more challenging environment that we are now in and to build further on what ASEAN has already achieved. So Southeast Asia and ASEAN, therefore, will remain a big part of Singapore's mind share and our foreign policy. Therefore, Singapore needs to maintain a delicacy of perceptions, to come back to Dr. Go King Sui's phrase, towards developments in our region. And we need this delicacy of perceptions not just amongst ministers and government officials, but also amongst the intelligentsia, amongst our financial and business community, our media, and Singaporeans of many professions who need to know our region in order to work, to do business, or just to know how to get along with neighbours and partners. Therefore, ICS continues to play an important role enriching our collective knowledge of the region. And I hope it will, in its, this process, enhance mutual understanding among our ASEAN partners too. I'm confident that ICS will rise to the challenge and continue to do remarkable work so that ASEAN will truly become one vision, one identity, one community. So I wish ICS every success in its next 50 years and thank you very much. <laughs>